I can't res resist the temptation to start by putting myself into the context of your fun lecture. Um, I started working with Phage in 1963. I came as a mathematician to the University of Rochester in um, radiation biology and biophysics department, and radiation biology was definitely a major focus, and worked then with John Weberg, who came six months after I did, and that was when I first heard about Phage, um, when the chairman of the department took me along to, when he was invited for lunch, and um, within an hour I had fallen in love with Phage, and the chairman wandered away, and John and I decided that I would be his first student. Uh, he was a biochemist who was a student, who was a postdoc with Luria at MIT at that time, and he was mainly interested in DNA replication, and the subject of my thesis was um, the use of 5-hydroxymethylcytosine in T4 DNA and what that had to do with the transition from host to viral metabolism, and um, wound up showing, for example, that um, having mutants in DCTPase and the enzymes required to put hydroxymethylcytosine into the DNA. And if you had enough of those mutants, you could get DNA made, but you'd make no phage particles. And that turned out a few years later to be found to be because T4 also made a protein that shut off all transcription of cytosine-containing DNA, including its own progeny DNA, if it had cytosine in it. So, um, and Luria was among that group, one of my founding fathers. I gave my first talk about phage at Cold Spring Harbor in 1964, and um, you wanted a little gossip story. Um, afterwards, in the um, bar downstairs, this tall, lanky guy came up and started asking me all sorts of questions. And, um, clearly, it listened very carefully, and I was highly flattered at all the questions. And the more we talked, the more I decided, had I not been rather young, rather attractive, and not yet obviously pregnant, um, the person would have been less interested. And so finally, I said, um, sorry, I need to go do something. And I said, by the way, I didn't catch your name. And he said, oh, I'm Jim Watson. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my introduction at that level. Um, and Phage has been basically my life ever since. Uh, in the long run, I moved to Evergreen State College in 72. Um, until then, I'd always gone to Cold Spring Harbor, but I never went to the Phage course. Um, we did do use of radioactive labeling in order to understand what was happening with the host DNA and the Phage DNA and all those sorts of things. And we still occasionally do that kind of thing, and we use my PhD thesis as our source of our methods for that. People don't do that much anymore. But um, I wound up then leading the group that did the um, genome of T4 uh, after something in Bruce Albert's lab in 1979. But in 75, I started having a phage course or a phage, sorry, a phage meeting at Evergreen State College. And that was partly because lambda and temperate phages seem to have largely taken over Cold Spring Harbor, and partly because Cold Spring Harbor was a long ways away and had become very expensive once Jim Watson started it. And uh, this summer we'll be having our 21st biennial Evergreen International T4 meetings, or phage meetings, sorry. But they were T4 meetings and for the first 12 of those meetings, and both of the big books about T4 came out of those meetings with everybody in the field working together um, to do each chapter, all of the people working in that field. Collaboration was the thing you didn't mention as strongly that I think is a really important element of the whole phage community, um, where there was much more of that than competition. Um, so I'm, I'm still interested in that whole question of, of collaboration. Um, I didn't learn about phage therapy um, until 1990 when I was, when we were finishing the T4 genome after so many years, and I wound up spending four months in the Soviet Union 
uh, working in the uh, with Vadim Nesanjinov um, and the other people mainly involved were um, from Japan and from um, Fumi Arisaka, uh, Wolfgang Ruger from Germany, and Gisela Mozik, who absolutely should be mentioned as one of the founding people of the phage community in the United States, and uh, not nearly often enough is mentioned. Um, now I have to figure out where I have to push things. So um, I've gotten more and more interested in the whole question of the early history of phage, but only since only since that 1990 visit to the Soviet Union when I went to Georgia and was shown that people were routinely using phage therapeutically. And I first was very suspicious because I had never heard of any of this early work. Um, much early success was reported by De Harel and some of the others who studied phage very carefully. Um, and he did his first therapy work with humans in 1919, but it didn't get published till much later. Um, there were, but there were papers starting just a couple of years later, some of the early ones also from Poland and other places. Um, and by the late 1920s, there were labs and companies in Europe and in the US making phage products um, with a lot of varying degrees of success. And one of the interesting things from that is that um, most of the really good work during that period was happening in France and was available only in French. And it's only been relatively recently that people became more aware of everything that had happened there. Uh, Sarah Kuhl, who's here, did, who's a physician, did some of the translation. And you did some of the uh, translation and so forth. But um, it was important that that actually was happening being produced and sold until 1976. And there was work going on even until today with some physicians in France. Now they were having to use phage from, um, the, from Russia or from Georgia. Um, but the phage that products that are available from Georgia were not originally from there. It was from de Harel's laboratory of bacteriophage that made the coliphage and the intestophage and the peophage, all the names are the same even, um, that were produced there. And what you get in terms of phage from Georgia still are ones that started from, from those. Um, and there was a lot of really good work that was going on then. Uh, there was a full 1936 issue of the journal La Medicine that really is an excellent exploration of phage treatment of dysentery and typhoid fever and acute colitis and peritonitis and prostate and urinary infections, bronchiolosis and so forth. And um, there's a uh, article in Bacteriophage in 2011, Abaddon is the first author, uh, that includes a lot of references to that, but I encourage people to go back who have any knowledge of French or can get a hold of some of that to also read the originals as well as what's there. Um, in the USA, um, in the late 1920s, you had phage in various university and public health labs, that some of which uh, were mentioned in the last talk, and Aerosmith. I put Pulitzer Prize, it was actually the Nobel Prize. Um, many successful high profile cases were widely publicized. Um, we didn't, we who were working in phage in the 60s and 70s knew absolutely nothing about that. I had no idea until well after I got into therapy interests that that was happening. But just as one example, um, there was a Western, the first major Western movie star, Tom Mix, had a ruptured appendix and peritonitis. And um, his doctor knew that at Stanford there was a therapeutic phage lab, and they flew phage to LA. They injected it intraperitoneally. Um, they immediately actually also took some of his bacteria and sent a second batch of phage that was specially selected. And by eight days, he was well. And that was tracked in major newspapers all around the country. And there were a whole series of these kinds of um, things that came out of well-known 
people. Um, Marilyn Monroe was another one later. Um, but all of those cases were not ones that were from the, Eli, the phage that were being made during that same period by several major corporations, Eli Lilly, E.R. Squibb, Abbott Labs. And in fact, the, none of those were licensed or approved. And the FDA looked at them, and also Daharel himself um, did a study of about 20 of such products and found that most of them had no activity. Uh, so in other words, the good work was coming out of the same thing that happened in Georgia that did so well with phage then later, where you had um, academically oriented labs that were working closely with uh, physicians. The same thing was true of what developed in Poland then at, in Wroclaw, which has a major phage institute, that the work was going on between the academics and local physicians, surgeons, uh, with careful, constant discussion back and forth and testing. And I think as we try to think about phage becoming um, some major uh, piece, perhaps, of the answer to um, what's going on with antibiotic resistance, we need to keep in mind that the nature of working with phage often requires this kind of discussions back and forth, and not just some, an attempting to get a one-size-fits-all. Um, the Daharel was actually a professor at Yale from 1928 to 33, and then became frustrated with the financial problems in this country as it went into the Depression, and with efforts to prevent him from going back every summer to help work with his company in Paris. And he wound up moving back to France. And that was when, actually, Georgia really got seriously drawn. And then uh, further into the Soviet Union by F Felix de Harel going, um helping to set up the institute there. But it's not some primarily a Soviet thing to start with. It was after that, though, that the Soviet Union developed ways of making tablets, um, developed very extensive use of it uh, during the early days of the Second World War. Um, there are a lot of reports out, and more and more some of those are available in the literature. But double-blind trials was not what was being used during those kinds, those periods. Um, there was careful watching of what happened. But the idea of if you had something that could cure, um, blindly giving half the people something that was just a placebo was not yet, I think, in this country either very much. <coughs> um, in 1934, um, though, you had the, um, the American Medical Association doing a year-long report looking at over 100 papers. They concluded that only staph phage treatment is consistently reliable, and the others couldn't be depended on. But they didn't look at any of the French work. They only w looked at the fr work in English. So that's, it's interesting to me that that's at the same time when you had the French um, much different sort of thing. There were a lot of things still going on in this country, though. One of the interesting stories um, in, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, I have this chronic cough. <coughs> Um, in, uh, in 1948, <coughs> 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 sorry, um, <coughs> usually there are flu can block this. I have something to drink. Cold water makes it work. It's worse. Um. <laughs> Thank you, though. <coughs> used to always use Theraflu, and that completely kept me from coughing. I just tried some Dayquil, and that doesn't seem to work as well. Theraflu is no longer in the shops. So I'm desperate. Um, anyway, in uh, 
no, sorry, in 2001, I was invited to give a talk on drug discovery and development in Bangalore, India, by the fellow who went on to start Ganga Jen. That makes it worse, too. <laughs> It'll work. Um, it's rather strange. I, I got a cough since 1990 that started when I was on a study section at NIH and got a nasty virus that led to problems. Anyway, um, and I need to talk more softly. Um, I was invited to give this keynote talk on drug discovery and development in Bangalore, India, at a symposium being put on by AstraZeneca, who was very interested in the whole thing. And that was when Ramakandran was starting the India company, Indian company, Ganga Jen. And the person who introduced me was Gary Skulnick, who many of you know from Stanford Infectious Diseases. And he wanted to introduce me in order to tell the story of why he got involved in working with microbiology. And the story was that in 1948, my mother was dying of typhoid fever before they had antibiotics. And my father read in the Journal of Bacteriology about a Los Angeles scientist who had discovered a phage that killed salmonella typhi. He called up this, and that was a mouse study, by the way, that he had read about. He called up this guy, and it was flown up on, to us on Seattle on a DC-3. My father injected my mother in the hospital with this phage. His father was a microbiologist at the University of Washington, and his mother had been in the hospital with high fever for three weeks, and he had been taken to say goodbye. So they, they felt she was dying. Um, the next day, she was perfectly well. That's real infectious disease experimentation, a mix of science and daring and desperation. This is taken directly by something, from something he had on the web as well as talking about it then. It was only later that we learned that there was, and learned it mainly from a fellow um, in Switzerland who was writing a book about, about phage therapy, um, that there was much data that laid a solid foundation for this life-saving decision, and not just the mouse work. One of the most spectacular accomplishments was the ra rapidity, rapidity sorry, with which the patient returned to his normal mental outlook. In 24 to 46 hours, patients who had been comatose and in the typhoid state amazed everyone by cheerful, grateful attitude, asked for food vociferously. And that's from a 1946 um, article by Knauf in the medical literature, which we were totally unaware of. Nobody in the phage community was reading the, that literature, and this, wa this wasn't until the mid um, until about 2004 that um, Thomas Heusler unearthed that data. Um, as we consider what should be required today for introducing phage therapies that have saved lives for so many years in Eastern Europe and France, it's worth thinking about the challenge that was made then and, and to what degree we need to pay attention to, to such things. Um, the picture here is of one of the phages that was part of that collection phage called VI1 that's being studied recently. And the phage that are used, that one of the phages that we isolated, for example, against E. coli 0157 is a co close relative of this group of phages. They're a particularly interesting group. Um, research went on despite some of the things that were happening. And some of the key research was done, for example, by Rene Dubot, uh, who was at Harvard by that time. And uh, he was interested in the question that was being raised that phage couldn't possibly be working because it would be cleared out of the bloodstream too fast after, um, after addition to be useful. And indeed, if he just injected phage intraperitoneally into mice, what he saw was that it very quickly got into the blood at very high levels. And, um, a little got across into the brain, but it disappeared within a couple of days. Um, however, he did some experiments then where he also um, injected those mice intracerebrally with, with Shigella dysenteria, which was the bacteria those phage hit, and then treated them intraperitoneally. And what you find is that then, instead of the bacteria um, in the brain 
being very low and disappearing very rapidly, oops, sorry, the phage, instead of the phage disappearing very rapidly, what you had was now up to 10 to the ninth phage per gram in the brain. In other words, those few phage had gotten across. Is this the pointer? No, oh, that's a clicker. Where's the pointer? Ah. Oh. Okay, so here it was in the brain. This was that same experiment if you didn't have the bacteria in the brain and this much was in the blood. If you had the bacteria in the brain, not only were most of the animals saved from death, but the levels got very high and stay, stayed very high until the bacteria were gone and then dropped off rapidly. Um, a few got back into the bloodstream so that there was more than there had been otherwise. So in other words, the phage were able to cross the blood-brain barrier and are able in the same way in a lot of other kinds of studies with, for example, um, if you have problems with osteoporosis, they can get into the brain, they can get into these compartments, they can go at very low levels through the bloodstream and stay there as long as you have a reservoir. Um, we got drawn in, well, uh, in 1990 when I spent four months in the Soviet Union and finally began to believe that, to know about phage therapy and to believe what, that it might work, um, we went on to talk about it and um, people, somebody who came to hear a talk that I gave in 2000 uh, wanted us to work with them at, at Texas A&M to try to um, see if we couldn't use phage to treat E. coli 0157 and clean it, clear it out of sheep. We got drawn into working there. Um, and one of our undergraduates went down to work with him to test some of our nearly 100 phages we, that we'd been working with, T4-like phages. And, um, some hit 0157, but only weakly, it turned out. But down there, there was something where there was a flock of ewes with, that were being treated orally with E. coli 0157 to try anything they could to get rid of. That was their job, to clean it out of livestock. And they were using things like probiotics and chemicals and so forth. And they found that one sheet flock of sheep that they were trying to use to study these uh, were actually totally resistant to the E. coli 0157. The normal procedure was to give the bacteria at high levels to wait three days to test to be sure the bacteria really were there and then to um, give whatever antidote they were trying to use, whatever treatment, and then two days later to slaughter the animals and to see what the status was. Well, with these, by the second day, the 0157 was completely gone. And the, um, what, and so Peter decided he'd of course need to look for phage. He came from my lab, so what else would he look for? And he indeed found 0157, found a phage, which we called CEV1, which was T4-like. Um, later on, Another fellow from my lab was a postdoc, went down to check whether that phage would really work, and he realized he needed to first screen the, back to screen the um, sheep that had been brought in to see whether they already had phage. And it turned out that um, 20 out of 39 were phage positive after, en after enrichment, not initially, but after enrichment. And they isolated what turned out to be a new phage that was T5-like. Um, but without really um, knowing that part of the story, what they had was um, here, if you, you could either give no natural phage, um, in other words, just the, um, ju just the bacteria, if they gave the 0157 phage, the CEV1, to these sheep that had no natural phage, 
it took it down a good couple of orders of magnitude. If you did a mixture of those, that phage plus the new phages, it took it down a lot more. But this is the most interesting one. If you took some of those sheep that had phage by enrichment before the start, at three days, the 0157 was still in high levels. But by five days, with no added phage, they were gone. So in other words, this was saying that, like in the oceans, uh, what you have is that um, if something happens, that there's suddenly a lot of the bacteria um, that can get to high levels phage that were present in very small amounts. So that led to a lot of interest in going further. Um, I'll just mention the work that was done by Harold Brousseau trying to go towards trials in Bangladesh using phage therapy. Worked for about 15 years, first taking a group. One of these dropped off. I don't know where it's supposed to be. <laughs> um. <laughs> He started with some of our T4-like phages and found that they would hit uh, bacteria from these infant diarrheal patients in Bangladesh, where 27% of infant diarrhea is caused by coliform bacteria, but they didn't work very efficiently. And so then he decided he needed to isolate a bunch of new phages um, against those, and they isolated and characterized nearly 100 phages from the infant diarrheal patients, and wound up choosing 50 of them and uh, doing a great deal of work both on studying the properties of those phages and using them to study um, various aspects of safety and so forth. And then they carried a double-blind uh, study out with a cocktail in Bangladesh uh, with that and also with a Russian control cocktail. Um, the results finally haven't been published. They actually, um, uh, Nestle stopped the trial after just 100 patients. They got impatient, I think, but they didn't have any results yet then. Um, and there are, the, the rumors at least have it that though there were no damage, that they didn't really spe speed up the healing of these patients. But it was just being added to the liquid that they were getting in the hospital anyway, and virtually none of them were dying. And the only thing he could have tested was whether the healing was faster. And uh, not really a very, uh, not necessarily the best way to prove principle that phage therapy works or doesn't. One of the most interesting things, though, that came out had to do with the choice of host for bacteriophage se selection. And when he tried selecting the phages using a um, pathogenic strain of E. coli that's very widespread, what he got was a whole bunch of cyphoviruses, and they all had very narrow spectra. When he used E. coli K12, what he got was all T4-related phages, some of them the very different schizo T4, some of them the closely related, and all of the 15 phages that he used were T4 related, and they had a, among them a, quite a broad host range and a lot of very interesting phages. So in other words, what was happening was when you used the individual, um, uh, when, when you used a pathogenic strain, you were only seeing things that were binding to the outside. Um, and you find with T4-like phages, some of them will hit a great many, some will hit only a few, and it's not related to their other properties. Um, we can talk later if you have questions about how that works. I won't go into it, but just want to talk a few minutes now about the question of today, what we want to do. Um, and I want to suggest that staph phages are probably the best for collaborative proof of principal trials. Um, there's a lot of work, uh, or McNeil at Columbia, um, extensive French use, staph phage lysate and so forth, and the staph phage K-like phages. Um, my first experience with actually 
uh, working with um, phage therapy involved taking a fellow named Alfred, Alfred Gertler when I went on, on the way back from that talk in Bangladesh. And he had um, very badly smashed an ankle and had staff draining for his ankle for four, four years despite a full year on IV antibiotics. This is his bacteria. These are staph phages. These are pieces of something called phage bioderm. But this is interesting. This is the normal disk for the antibiotic that they were using IV for a full year on him. And the bacteria that were coming out of his ankle were still totally sensitive to that. So the problem wasn't resistant to the antibiotic, but that it couldn't get in. Um, and he wound up um, completely being cured of that problem. Uh, within 10 days, they couldn't detect it anymore coming out of there. Um, and later on, there were a couple of times when he had a little bit of a flare-up, but there seemed to be still a few phage left in the bone, as well as that, after he had gotten back. And um, he's still doing fine. Um, just the last couple of things. This, the first uh, use of phage that I saw in 1996 in Tbilisi was with phage for a fellow who, had, who was a diabetic who had an infected foot. And uh, here it had been split open to let him, to let Gaurav Grisalia, who was the chief surgeon there, uh, work with it. And um, I saw it three days later. There was no sign of purulence. We've gone ahead and uh, are using phage from Tbilisi this, to treat cases of diabetic ulcers, which have been um, totally not healing for many, many months on antibiotics or anything else, and we're getting quite rapid healing. Uh, there's a poster downstairs that you can look at, or wherever they are, <laughs> that you can look at more, about more details. But the podiatrist who works with me, who's using, here we're using a pure sequenced commercial staph phage from Tbilisi. And um, he gave a, the podiatrist gave a poster uh, just a few months ago at the Desert Foot meeting in um, Phoenix, which is put on by the VA hospital head podiatrist there um, of a series of case studies like this. And it got awarded the best poster at the meeting with a prize of $1,500 that's going into our nonprofit Phage Biotics Foundation. And they're very interested in trying to work towards doing um, clinical trials there with it. And it's really interesting seeing the response. That was the second talk he had earlier at one in Philadelphia by the wound surgeons meeting. Um, Again, it had been given the first prize. And one of the main things we need to do is to get people, get the physicians and the patients excited about the possibilities. Um, there, one of the advantages of using staff would be that um, there are a lot of phages available. Um, so I want to make a special tribute to Goram Gvasalia, who died recently, who was the chief surgeon in these experiments, and to Reza Wadamia who headed the, the Eliava Institute in recent years and, and who did all the work with the um, sequencing of the staph phage and, and so forth. We were partners on that over a decade ago. And some of the other people involved have included, for example, um, Sandra Morales, who's now one of the leading scientists at Amplify. Um, and this is uh, Zemfira Alavitsa, who was the main uh, person at the Eliava, who was the go-between for all of those years, was it from 96, between, with the surgeons and the close partnership. So um, thank you. And I want to just mention our 21st biennial Evergreen meeting will be August 2nd to 7th. Um, the journal Viruses uh, is going to put out a special issue uh, related to that meeting, and um, Rob Levine is the person to do it. And I have forms about if you want to submit papers in advance to that. Um, anyway, that's the that's the end. <laughs>